The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall Chapter 10 Christmas came, and with it the girl's eighteenth birthday, but the shadows that clung around her home did not lessen, nor could Stephen, groping about in those shadows, find a way to win through to the light. Everyone tried to be cheerful and happy, as even sad people will do at Christmas, while the gardeners brought in huge bundles of holly with which to festoon the portraits of Gordon's rich red-berried holly that came from the hills, and that year after year would be sent down to Morton. The courageous-eyed Gordons looked out from their reefs, unsmiling, as though they were thinking of Stephen. In the hall stood the Christmas tree of her childhood, for Sir Philip loved the old German custom, which would seem to insist that even the age to be a child and play with God on his birthday. At the top of the tree swung the little wax Christ child in his spangled nightgown with gold and blue ribbons, and the little wax Christ child bent downwards and sideways because, although small, he was rather heavy, or, as Stephen had thought when she too had been small, because he was trying to look for his presence. In the morning they all went to church in the village, and the church smelt of coldness and fresh bruised green stuff of the laurel and holly and pungent pine branches that wreathed the oak pulpit and framed the altar and the anxious-faced eagle who must carry the scripture on his wings he too was looking quite festive very redolent of england it was the small church with its apple-cheeked choir boys in newly washed garments with its young oxford parson who in summer played cricket for the glory of god and the good of the county with its trim congregation of neighbouring gentry who had recently purchased an excellent organ, so that now they could hear the opening bars of the hymns with a feeling of self-satisfaction, but with something else too that came nearer to heaven, because of those lovely old songs of Christmas. The choir raised their sexless, untrampled voices, while shepherds watched their flocks, sang the choir, and Anna's soft mesmo mingled and blended with her husband's deep boom and puddle soprano. Then Stephen sang too for the sheer joy of singing, though her voice at best was inclined to be husky. While shepherds watched their flocks at night, caroled Stephen, for some reason thinking of Rafferty. After church, the habitual Christmas greetings. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, same to you, many of them. Then home to Morton and the large midday dinner, turkey, plum pudding with the crisp brandy butter, and the mince pies that inevitably gave pudding indigestion. Then, dessert, with all sorts of sweet fruits out of the box, crystallized fruits that made your hands sticky, together with fruit from Malton's greenhouse, and from somewhere that no one could ever remember, the elegant miniature lady apples that you ate skin and all in two bites if you were greedy. A long afternoon spent in waiting for darkness when Anna could light the Christmas tree candles, and no ringing of bells to disturb the servants, not until they must all file in for their presents which were piled up high round the base of the tree, on which Anna would light the small candles. Dusk drew the curtains, it was dark enough now, and someone must go fetch Anna the taper, but she must take care of the little wax Christ child, who liked many lights, even though they should melt him. Stephen, climb up, will you, and tie back the Christ child. His toe is almost touching that candle. Then Anna, applying the long-lighted taper from branch to branch, very slowly and gravely, as though she accomplished some ritual, as though she herself were a minister priestess. Anna, very slender and tall in a dress whose soft folds swept her limbs and lay round her ankles. Ring three times, will you, Philip? I think they're all lit. No, wait. All right, now. I'd miss that top candle. Stephen, begin to sort out the presents, please. Dear, your father's just rung for the servants. Oh, and Pudding, might you push over the table? I might need it. No, not that one. The table by the window. A sudden sound of voices, a stifled giggle, the servants filling in for the green basil door, and only the butler and footman familiar in appearance, the others all strangers in Muffet. Mrs. Watson, the cook, 
in black silk with jet trimmings. The scullery maid in electric blue cashmere, one housemaid in mauve, another in green, and the upper of three in dark terracotta, while Anna's own maid wore an old dress of Anna's. Then the old men from outside, from the gardens and stables, men bareheaded who were usually seen in their caps, old Williams displaying a widening bold patch, and wearing tight trousers instead of his breeches, old Williams walking stiff because his new suit felt like cardboard, and because his white collar was too tight, and because his hard, made-up black bow would slip crooked. The grooms to the boys, all excellently shining from their neatly oiled heads to their well-polished noses. The boys were very awkward, short-sleeved and rough hands, shuffling a little because trying not to, and the gardeners led in by the grave Mr. Hopkins, who wore black of a Sunday and carried a church service, and whose knowledge of the eels that all great flesh is heir to, had given his face a patient, patent expression. Men smelling of soil these, in spite of much scrubbing, men whose necks and those hands were crossed and recrossed by a network of tiny and earth-clogged furrows, men whose backs would bend early from tending to the earth. There they stood in the wake of grave Mr. Hopkins with their eyes on the big, littered Christmas tree, while they never so much as glanced at the flowers that sprung from many long hours of their labour. No, instead they must just stand and grape at the tree, as though with its candles and Christmas child and all it was some exotic plant in Kew's gardens. Then Anna called her people by name, and to each one she gave the gifts of that Christmas, and they thanked her, thanked Stephen, and thanked Sir Philip, and Sir Philip thanked them for their faithful service, as had always been good custom at Malton for more years than Sir Philip himself could remember. Thus the day had passed by in accordance with tradition, every one from the highest to the lowest remembered, nor had Anna forgotten her gifts for the village, warm shawls, sacks of coal, cough mixture and sweets. Sir Philip had sent a cheque to the vicar, which would keep him a long time in the cricketing flannels, and Stephen had carried a carrot to Raffi, and two lumps of sugar to the fat, aged Collins, who, because he was all but blind in one eye, had bitten her hand in place of his sugar, and Puddle had written at great length to her sister who lived down in Cornwall, and whom she neglected, except on such memory-jogging occasions as Christmas, when, somehow, we always remember, and the servants had gorged themselves to replenish and and the hunters had rested in their hay-scented stables, while out in the fields seagulls had come far inland and feasted in their turn on humble creatures, grubs and slugs and other unhappy small fly, much relished by birds and hated by farmers. Night closed down the house, and out of the darkness came the anxious young voices of the village children. Noel, Noel, piped the anxious young voices, lubricated by sweets from the lady of Moulton. Sir Philip stirred the logs in the hall to a blaze, while Anna sank into a deep chair and watched them. Her hands that were wearied by much ministration lay over the arms of the chair in the firelight, and the firelight sawed out the rings on her hands, and it played with the white flames in her diamonds. Then Sir Philip stood up and he gazed at his wife, while she stared at the logs, not appearing to notice him. But Stephen, watching in silence from her corner, seemed to see a dark shadow that stole in between them. Beyond this, her vision was mercifully dim, otherwise she must surely have recognised that shadow. On New Year's Eve, Mrs. Atrium gave a dance in order, or, so she said, to please Violet, who was still rather young to attend the hunt balls, but who dearly loved gaiety, especially dancing. Violet was plump, pert and adolescent, and had lately insisted on putting her hair up. She liked men, who, in consequence, also liked her, for like begets like when it concerns to the sexes, and Violet was full of what people called allure, or, in simpler language, of sexual attraction. Roger was home for Christmas from Sandhurst, so that he would be there to assist his mother, 
a good-looking youth with a tiny moustache which he tentatively fingered. He assumed the grand air of a man of the world who had actually weathered about nineteen summers. He was hoping to join his regiment quite soon, which greatly augmented his self-importance. Could Mrs. Adram have ignored Stephen Gordon's existence, she would almost certainly have done so. She disliked the girl. She had always disliked the girl. What she called Stephen's queerness aroused her suspicion. She was never quite clear as to what she suspected, but felt sure it must be something outlandish. A young woman of her age? To ride like a man? I call it preposterous, declared Mrs. Adram. It can safely be said that Stephen at eighteen had in no way outgrown her dread of the Atrium. There was only one member of the family who liked her, she knew, and that was the small, hen-pecked colonel. He liked her because, a fine horseman himself, he admired her skills and her courage out hunting. It is a pity she's so tall, of course, he would grumble, but she does no horse and how to stick on one. Now my children might have been brought up on Margaret. They are just about fit to ride beach donkeys. But Colonel Adrian would not count at the dance. Indeed, in his own house he was seldom counted. Stephen would have to endure Mrs. Adrian and Violet. And then Roger was home from Sandhurst. Their antagonism had never quite died, perhaps because it was too fundamental. Now they covered it up with a cloak of good manners, but these two were still enemies at heart, and they knew it. No, Stephen did not want to go to that dance, though she went in order to please her mother. Nevertheless, awkward and apprehensive, Stephen arrived at the atriums that night, little thinking that fate, the most expert of tricksters, was waiting to catch her just round the corner. Yet so it was, for during that evening Stephen met Martin, and Martin met Stephen, and their meeting was great with potential for them both, though neither of them could know it. It all happened quite simply, as such things will happen. It was Roger who introduced Martin Hallam. It was Stephen who explained that she danced very badly. It was Martin who suggested that they sit out their dances. Then, how quickly it occurs if the thing is predestined, they suddenly knew that they liked each other that some chord had been struck to a pleasant vibration, and this being so, they sat out many dances, and they talked for quite a long while that evening. Martin lived in British Columbia, it seemed, where he owned several farms and a number of orchards. He had gone out there after the death of his mother for six months, but had stayed on for the love of the country, and now he was having a holiday in England. That was how he got to know young Roger Adrian. They had met up in London, and Roger had asked him to come down for the week, and so here he was, but it felt almost strange to be back in England. Then he talked of the vastness of the new country that was yet so old, of its snow-capped mountains, of its canyons and gorges, of its deep princely rivers, of its lakes, above all of its mighty forest, and when Martin spoke of those mighty forests, his voice changed. It became almost reverential, for this young man loved the trees with a primitive instinct, with a strange and inexplicable devotion, because he, like Stephen, could talk of his trees, and because she liked him, she could listen while he talked, feeling that she too would love his great forest. His face was very young, clean-shaven and bonny. He had bonny brown hands with spatula fingers. For the rest, he was tall with a loosely knit figure, and he slouched a little when he walked from much riding. But his face had a charming quality about it, especially when he talked of his trees. It glowed, it seemed to be inwardly kindled, and it asked for a real and heartfelt understanding of the patience and the beauty and the goodness of trees. It was eager for your understanding. Yet in spite of this touch of romance in his make-up, which he could not keep out of his voice at moments, he spoke simply, as one man will speak to another, very simply, not trying to create an impression. He talked about trees as some men talk of ships, 
because they love them and the element they stand for, and Stephen, the awkward and bashful, the tongue-tied, heard herself talking in her turn, quite freely, heard herself asking him endless questions about forestry, farming in the care of vast orchards, thoughtful questions, unromantic but apt, such as one man will ask of another. Then Martin wished to learn about her, and they talked of her fencing, her studies, her writing, and she told him about Rafferty, who was named for the poet, and all the while she felt natural and happy, because here was a man who was taking her for granted, who appeared to find nothing eccentric about her or her taste, but who, quite simply, took her for granted. If you asked Martin Hallowett to explain why it was that he accepted the girl at her own valuation, he would surely have been unable to tell you. It had happened, that was all, and there the thing ended. But, for whatever the reason, he felt drawn to this friendship that had leapt so suddenly into being. Before Anna left the dance with her daughter, she invited the young man to drive over and see them, and Stephen felt glad of the invitation because now she could share her new friend with Morton. She said to Morton that night in her bedroom, I know you're going to like Martin Harlowitz.